Hello, everybody. Welcome to Connections Online 2021, the very first Connections Online conference. I am Chris Weave. I am the conference director. Uh, I also have in my camp uh, Brant Guillory and the Armchair Dragoons and Merle Robinson and Gary uh, Mangle. So um, thank you very much for uh, all the assistance I've gotten from those gentlemen. They've done a fantastic job trying to put together uh, what we hope will be a good conference for you. So Connections Online is the latest in a series of connections, uh, an entire family of connections conferences. Uh, Matt Caffrey is going to give you the history of connections uh, over the years, but in summary, started in the early 1990s for the first couple of decades, it was pretty much a US only event. Starting about 10 years ago, other people decided that they were gonna start doing connections conferences. And so now there's an entire series of connections conferences throughout the world. Uh, in this time of COVID, I decided that it was time to do one that would be focused on the online uh, arena um, specifically. So this, um, this conference is a little bit different from the other ones. Um, the other ones have all gone online in this time of COVID, but this one is a little bit different in that it was intended as an online conference from the very start. And, uh, and as a result of that, we tried really hard to optimize for the online environment. We didn't just say, how could we do an in-person conference online? We said, what makes it, you know, what unique capabilities do we have in the online environment that we could use? So first of all, what we did is we limited the conference time for um, from 10 a.m. Eastern time to 4 p.m. Eastern time. I call those time zones uh, Los Angeles to London. Now, you could call it San Francisco to San Martino, you could call it Washington State to Warsaw, but you get my point. Uh, the idea there is we have a focus group, uh, a focused time space to expand the geographic space where people can do it without having to get up in the middle of the night or whatever. So for those of you who live in Hawaii or Japan or Australia, I'm sorry, there's only so much I can do you know, on a rotating earth. Somebody's gonna have to get up in the middle of the night or alternatively, you can watch it on YouTube because that's one of the other things that we decided we were gonna do is we were gonna put it on YouTube so that people could access it whenever was convenient for them. Um, we're using a technology called StreamYard to stream it directly to YouTube. We're not using Zoom. Um, Zoom is really, Zoom and GoToMeeting and all those other tools are really designed to let everybody get together on a VTC and then they have a secondary bolted on capability of, of like streaming to YouTube or Facebook or something like that. StreamYard is really designed to go directly to those things and as a result, it's optimized for those things. Since we decided that YouTube is the best way to distribute this conference, that's what we went with. So also we have Discord. So if, you have, if you're watching this live and you haven't yet um, uh, registered for the conference, if you register, you'll get access to the Discord server. That's how you can ask us questions. So we're not paying any attention to the any comments you put on on YouTube. If you want to ask us a question, you have to go through Discord. So you may also notice that there are no breaks scheduled for this conference, and that's because I am not your jailer. You can get up and leave at any time. If you're in an in-person conference, right, you, you see a lot of people towards the end of the session looking at their watch because they want to go grab something to eat or they want to go to the restroom or something like that. Because you're doing this, you're watching this through YouTube, because we're doing it the way we're doing it, anytime you can hit pause and walk away, at any time you can get up and go get a drink if you want. So there's no real point in scheduling and breaks. The uh, other piece of that, by the way, is we, we gave um, the two middle sessions of each day two hours each. So we start off, let me talk about that a little bit. We're starting off with an hour long session each morning. Then we do two two hour long sessions. And those two, the hour long sessions to start off with are generally envisioned as shorter sessions, um, in, originally sort of intended for like keynote address type stuff. The two hour sessions are panel discussions. In most cases, it's probably gonna be four people who each talk for 10 to 15 minutes. And then the moderator will ask them some questions and things like that. And then we'll um, then they'll take questions from the audience, and then we'll be done. 
I don't expect that the moderators will keep every panel around for two hours. Some of them they might, some of them they won't. But generally, if you've got a two hour long block, that's a natural amount of time to sort of let the panel tail off by itself. Moderators, if you're listening, you are fully authorized to throw the flag and call it. If, if after 75 minutes, you get to the point where it's like, you know what, I think this horse, we're not, you know, the horse isn't only dead, we're mad at the glue. If you reach that point, then you can just say, I think we've reached the end. See you all. The next panel will be in, you know, 30 minutes or whatever. So I'm not your jailer. Please feel free to get up, walk around, do whatever you need to do. The last session each day, or for the first two days anyway, is what I'm calling the YouTube session. And the idea behind that is we've distributed some links for videos on YouTube, and then we're going to have a discussion about those. So in today's session is Brian Train and Mike Markowitz, both uh, very practiced uh, artists in the art of practical game design, you know, making components, et cetera, et cetera. They've each done talks for the Georgetown University War Game Society, and those talks are available on YouTube, and then you can watch the session and they can answer questions about how to you know, physically produce games. The, uh, the talk tomorrow is in a, one that I think is especially good. It's on the Western Approaches Tactical Unit. Um, Matt Caffrey likes to talk about how war games actually have affected wars. This is one of the all-time best examples of this. This is basically a set of war games that they that the Brits ran during World War II in order to help them hunt submarines. It helped them train the people who were going after the submarines. It helped them develop tactics. And so if there was ever a wargaming success story, this is it. And so we've got uh, some people who recreated the game that they used to play. And uh, there's some video links that, that are available through Discord. You can click on those. They're also available on YouTube in the description of the panel. Watch those videos. Come and they'll have a discussion about how they recreated the game and how, um, how important that, that session was. So basically, that's what we're doing over the course of the next three days. Oh, I almost forgot. We also realized that outside of those core hours, there's an extended opportunity, we use the word extended specifically because we're calling it the extended schedule, to uh, have other events because the regular Connections US conference frequently has game night, there's a demo night, there's all sorts of different things where people get together and they talk about games and they do stuff that's really outside of the core hours of the conference. So our idea was, we'll open it to people doing lectures and, and games and stuff like that. And so there's actually events scheduled beyond those core hours. Some of those events ended up looking a lot like uh, what we considered uh, for the, the type of things for core events. So originally, we were thinking more in terms of like lots of people playing games, because the best way to study games is to play games. Um, we ended up with a lot more lectures and stuff than I think we originally intended, but that's perfectly fine. So. Uh, please sign up for those those extended events. Some of those extended events have, uh, especially the ones that actually are playing games, have limited seating. So you really do have to kind of register the, for those through tabletop events because there just may not be places for you if you don't register. So um, two last things. Uh, one of them is please look through Discord um, for announcements, especially check out the Connections USA June 2021 channel. That's got a call for papers and some other things about the upcoming Connections USA conference. That conference is going to be online, um, and, but uh, they uh, are more academically oriented in terms of having a call for papers, et cetera. We decided we weren't gonna go along with that. And part of the reason why we're not doing things like that has to do with my second last point, which is this is an experiment. We've never done one of these before. Um, a lot of our effort into doing the first one was building the foundation to build upon for future uh, connections online. We had to come up with the SOP manuals, et cetera, et cetera. Everything we had an idea to do, somebody had to sit down and write out a procedure to do it uh, so that we could recreate it the next time. I think we've got a pretty good foundation that we can move forward. I'm expecting that next year we'll be a little bit ahead of the curve uh, compared to where we are this year. Um, but you know, I, I'm 
really sort of proud of the event that we put together. I think we've got a lot of really good speakers and a lot of really good panelists that are going to come and do stuff. And that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to say for my introduction. So uh, let me thank Brant and Merle one more time, and I'll probably thank them again at the very end of the conference. And thank you to everybody who's agreed to participate in this. And now what I'm going to do, uh, Matt Caffrey is going to talk about the history of the Connections Conference uh, for the next, uh, you know, 30 to 50 or 30 to 40 minutes, we'll call it, because um, if, if he takes 40 minutes, we'll finish 10 minutes early. Uh, and uh, give me just a second and I will set up Matt's slides. So let me do that. And that. And Okay, for some reason it shut off my audio. So that's actually the other thing to keep in mind with an online conference like this that we're doing for the first time is that uh, sometimes it will do things like shut off your audio. Uh, uh, so, you know, please bear with us. Uh, this, uh, this technology stuff is fun. Merle, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay. All right, then. So I'm now going to turn it over to Matt Caffrey, who's going to talk to you about connections online. Matt, if you hit the, if you hit the down arrow, when okay. you want to go to the next slide. Okay, very good. Thank you, Chris. All right. Hi, everybody. The, um, I want to start by thanking Chris that this is not an easy thing to do. It wouldn't be an easy thing if it was done a dozen times before, but First time's always three times harder. And I'm really impressed by what he and Merle and the whole crew has pulled together. Uh, they've already got more people registered than the typical uh, Connections Conference. We're holding them down at Maxwell. So off to a great start. So uh, let's, so technology is a wonderful thing. Hitting this down arrow, right? Chris? It should. Okay. Oh, hold on a second. Let's do that. Now hit the down arrow. There we go. There we go. Okay. So so let me tell you a little bit about connections overall, the history of connections, how we got to where we are today. Um, basically, uh, the bottom line up front is that we're doing this because it's an important thing. It's, it's an important thing to do. Um, all wars cost lives. No matter how smart you are, no matter how smart you fight it, so the best way to, to suffer fewer casualties is to suffer none at all and achieve your objectives without going to war. You know, good work if you can get it. You, you may not always be able to do that. So odds are there'll be times when we have to fight. And if we do have to fight, war games can help that way too. They can help us fight in, in such a way that we have fewer casualties, shorter wars, less loss of treasure, as long as we war a game more effectively than our adversaries. And the Connections Conferences worldwide are there to help us war a game more effectively. Next. Oh. <laughs> okay. So a little bit about the, the mission. Uh, Chris already covered bits and pieces, method, history, structure, and all that good stuff. Okay. So our mission right from the start, it's been – tweaked a little over the years, advance and sustain the art, science, and application of war games. All those words very chosen very deliberately. Uh, we're trying to push the envelope, make war gaming better. Our adversaries are trying to make their war games better. So if we stand still, we fall behind. Sustain, um, we're all mortal. We need to bring along the next generation. Uh, that's one thing I'm really excited about with Chris, because I think with his online format, 
we'll have people uh, more junior in the field uh, be able to participate at a lower cost of, of coming in. And then the art, science, and application of wargaming very much feel that art and science are equal partners. Uh, the uh, 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 in the case of uh, uh, I went to an uh, engineering school, but we had a we, while I was there, we got an architecture school, and uh, we trained those architects in civil engineering 101, mechanical engineering 101, not because we wanted to turn the architects into engineers, but they needed to know enough civil engineering so they didn't draw these pretty pictures that, of houses that would not stand up. Uh, so, and yet they needed both. You, and architects need to be both artists and engineers. And I believe war games are most effective when they bring together art and science. And of course, the most effective war games in the world don't do you any good if you don't apply them. Uh, so our method is annual conferences and then websites that are around for 24-7. So here's the history. Uh, and uh, at one point, I was the war game research assistant at the School of Air Power, uh, School of Advanced Air Power Studies. Uh, now it's the School of Advanced Air and Space Power Studies, uh, and and I was the person that would teach war gaming and put on a war game and all that good stuff. And while I was there, uh, it was at the time of the Gulf War, Colonel Warden had been the one to bring together the planning staff in the base room of the Pentagon, come up with a plan called Instant Thunder that was improved in theater and renamed Desert Storm, and it worked out pretty well. Uh, so he was a living legend, and he was in charge of the Air Command and Staff College. And I had been lucky enough to be in the room twice when he was giving a talk, but I was just, you know, one guy sitting in the crowd. So as far as I knew, he, he did not know me from Adam. Well, it was the eve of Christmas Eve, the last duty day, and a couple of people had already left, and it was after lunch, and I was trying to figure out what I needed to do before I could leave for the holidays, and my phone rings, and I answer the phone, and it's the Colonel Warden, and he starts asking me all these questions about wargaming. Uh, it turns out that uh, he was very concerned that the state of wargaming operationally in the Air Force at that time didn't really reflect his his systems approach to, to warfare, that um, they had wargamed out the Instant Thunder plan. One of the key elements of that plan was to take down the electrical grid so the Iraqis' radars wouldn't, wouldn't function. And in the wargame, taking down the power grid had no effect on anything. Uh, and he knew that was wrong, but in the, the, the less impact shown, uh, he felt weak in the case for the plan. Then he gets to be coming on Air Command Staff College, and he sees that all the war games are attrition-based. And worse than that, he was saying, these games are just obnoxious to try to execute. The, the students are spending half their time trying to learn how to do the game. I want them to learn how to fight wars more effectively. Um, you know, is anybody doing everything right? And and I talked about some of the smart things the Navy was doing, some of the smart things the Marines, um, just how user-friendly, uh, relatively speaking, uh, commercial war games tended to be. And he said, well, does anybody do it all right? He says, well, no, not that I've found yet. He says, well, is there anything we can do to try to make things better? And I said, well, you know, we could do you know, like a conference or something so that people could learn from each other, the, the, everybody's best practice. And he says, okay, go ahead. And then he asked another question. I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Was I just asked to put on a conference? And he kept asking questions and, and you know, you don't interrupt full Colonel living legend. And um, so the call's over and I'm like, am I supposed to put on a conference? And I look around and, and most of the lights are off. Every, everybody's left. I'm the last person in the, in the school area. And uh, I go home for the holidays. And I have this bad habit I'm trying to work on that uh, when I don't know what to do, I don't do it. So um, it's now the first of the new year. 
um, over at the main building of Air Command Staff College, walking down the hallway, and Colonel Warden's coming the other way. And he sees me, and his whole face lights up, and he goes, hey, Matt, how's our conference coming? I was like, oh, um, uh, well, uh, i uh, been thinking about it a lot, sir. It says, oh, well, I have some time now. You want to go talk? No, 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 please let me get on your calendar. So just a few months later, uh, we had the first Connections Conference. And right from the very first execution, uh, the three-star general, commander of Air University, uh, was very much involved in the conference. Uh, he uh, would uh, be briefed on it every year. He was very much a big supporter of it. Uh, for the first several years, uh, the host was the Air Command and Staff College. Uh, they have a great deal of support. Uh, on, on several occasions, uh, several years, our commandant would insist on signing each and every invitation of folks to come to the conference. Uh, one of them in particular, General Brooks, liked to say that the Connections Conference was important to the school because we needed war games as comprehensive as our curriculum. Uh, so after a couple of years, uh, CADRE, which at that time was the parent organization to the Air Force Wargaming Institute, um, decided that they also wanted to host. So some of the sessions were held at Air Command Staff College. Some were held over at uh, the, the Wargaming Institute. And that helped out quite a bit as far as demos and game night and stuff like that because the, the Wargaming Institute was much better for that type of application. And then uh, 2002 was the last year at Air University. And one of the things that uh, was being discussed at that time is that this, the university was putting a lot of time and effort into trying to make sure that Connections was uh, you know, done right and done well. But we didn't have... Um, but yet, what was the what was the Air University getting out of it? And so we set up these working groups that said, you know, good point. Uh, you have different things that are priorities to you, different problems you're trying to solve. In exchange for you hosting, we will set up working groups that will work your problems. You tell us what those problems are, and we will set up a working group to address those problems. Did it the first time that year. Very, very effective. Uh, next. So 2003 was the first year that the Connections Conference started to move around to different places each year. And at the time, I wasn't happy about that. It would have been nice to stay at Air University. Great hosts, great facilities. But there's a lot of virtue to move to different places each year. Uh, one time we had it at uh, Rome, New York, and the wargaming community came to Rome, New York. Uh, Air Force uh, Research Lab has their information directorate up there. Uh, they have some great innovations in the area of wargaming, and the, the community came there and saw that. We had Air Force Model and Simulation Agency down in Orlando one year. We had uh, uh, the Air Force Academy, sort of, kind of, that's a long story. Uh, National Defense University hosted us uh, a number of times. The Marine Corps Wargaming Division at Quantico uh, hosted us a, a bunch of times. And while these were U.S. conferences, uh, most years we had at least a couple of international participants. I think it averaged about three different nations, maybe five different people. Uh, one year, I think we had um, seven nations and over 10 people. Uh, so we had some, uh, and one of those, uh, a uh, uh, Professor Phil Sabin, uh, went back to the UK, and he got together with uh, Graham, Graham uh, um, Longley Brown and uh, uh, Major uh, Tom Moat, and um, this is why I write down names. Um, oh, anyway. Uh, the four of them, and a gentleman from uh, the uh, uh, the UK's uh, uh, research lab, uh, and they put together the first international uh, connections conference. And it still has the the conference that draws the people from the live conference that draws the people from the most uh, different nations. Uh, and 
you know, they say in the, a democracy, the most important election is always the second one. Uh, well, and if you're trying to get something that's that's broadly uh, used across different nations, uh, the most important one is the second. And Con Connections UK was the second. And uh, they are, as I said, always have a great draw from people uh, all over the world. And I tell them they have this unfair advantage with the channel. Uh, but it's beyond that. They'll have people coming in from from uh, uh, Japan and in India and in Australia and a lot of countries that you can't get there from the channel. Well, people saw how uh, how effective Connections UK was, and they went back to their home nations and they said, you know, we can do that too. So we had Connections Oz, other words, Australia, uh, Connections the Netherlands. Uh, connections north, uh, Canada. Uh, France is different. France is always different. And, and that's one reason people love France. Uh, they really came up with a great idea. They had recently started a serious game conference. And they said, you know, Wargame is a serious game. Um, there are things that the serious game community can probably learn from the Wargame community and things the Wargame community can learn from serious games. And probably some situations, particularly if it's in the area of competition and trying to avoid a war from starting in the first place, where both together probably more valuable than either one by themselves. So uh, in uh, 2020, just before COVID hit, uh, I had a chance to go over there and be keynote speaker. And... Uh, um, started seeing people wearing masks and I'm like, what's going on? I need to listen to the news more. Um, but anyway, it was a, it was a great success. And so in, in 2020, when we were getting ready to do our, our annual connections U S conference, uh, it was becoming very obvious that we weren't going to be able to do it live. So just out of necessity and, uh, the center for naval analysis really came forward and, and, they, they hosted and provided a lot of uh, money and, and hired contractors and stuff to let us do the Connections Conference online. And one of the things that we discovered was that uh, when you do a conference online, not only do you get a lot more people, but uh, the turnout is a lot more international. I think I mentioned our, our best conference as far as international goes on our live conferences were seven di different nations. We, 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 wanted, we managed to do that twice ever since, since 2009, uh, since 1993. Well, um, we didn't set up the sign up in such a way that we captured the nation, the people were participating from, but in our feedback forms, there was a place to fill out. And just those people that attended and provided feedback were 17 different nations. So um, more folks, more junior folks, you know, all these great demographics. Well, I foolishly thought it would be over uh, by the summer of 2021. So we had done it online and, you know, it was a success and everything. And we were all set to go back and do it live. But I was thinking, you know, connections online really opens up a whole uh, international approach. There's so many strengths to that. Could this be something that would be done every year? And the people doing Connections US are pretty busy doing Connections US. Well, I was talking to Chris Weave, and I, I, it was kind of one of these great conversations. I think I was trying to talk him into something he'd already decided to do, which made my, my job quite easy. Uh, but uh, uh, he decided to take this on and make it a, firm, a permanent part of the, the collection of Connections conferences. And uh, as you heard him say before, trying to do the timing so it's uh, London to L.A. Uh, and, and, and then have everything go directly onto YouTube. So even folks beyond that, that envelope of areas where watching it live is reasonably uh, convenient can still watch it very close to real time uh, by catching it on uh, YouTube after they wake up. Uh, so good stuff.
Uh, so moving on from that, um, the so so how does the connections US work? Uh, Chris touched on a little bit of this already. Uh, we've got seminars, uh, much like we have here, keynotes and panels. Uh, but because it's live, we also have some other stuff. And, and this year, uh, we're going to do connections uh, online. Partially, we're a little bit more secure about it because Chris has done this and he's learned a lot and he's sharing with us. So we're going to try to do online versions of the stuff we do live, in part because I think it will be valuable to do, period, in part so that this year's connections can kind of be an infomercial for next year's connections, um, which, oh, please, God, can be on uh, can be live. But Game Showcase is where you pick a particular theme and get lots of different war games that are already on, on that theme. So if you're uh, trying to look at war gaming, insurgency, counterinsurgency, a lot of different war games on that. Uh, we had a year where we were at the Army War College, uh, about 45 minutes from Gettysburg. So you could have a lot of war games on on the Getty, Gettysburg and, you know, kind of topical in the area. Um, and then demos and posters. Uh, this was something that the Air Force Wargaming Institute did really, really well. We had a guy by the name of Red Urbane, a uh, Air Force major, who was just amazing at recruiting people from all across the Department of Defense, civilian industry, to come in and demo their, their software, demo their hardware. Um, and then a couple of years ago, we realized that not everybody could come to Connections, but they could send posters or, or PowerPoint slides we could rotate. And then uh, uh, game night, some of those games that were demoed, uh, you could actually sit down and play through. And then game lab, uh, this was, we had tried to do creating war games from scratch. And um, you can't do that during a conference that covers just a couple of days. It, it, it just takes too long. Um, and we we do it every year and people said, yeah, game lab is a good thing. Uh, and, and we had had some success. Uh, the uh, Rex Bryan likes to point out that one of his favorite war games um, got the initial outline of the design done during one of these game labs, uh, but it still wasn't working right. And then a, a, a gentleman, um, uh, uh, from National Defense University um, came up with a way of making this work. And in an irreligious way, we call it speed dating for war gamers, where we uh, have different issues that somebody wants to get consulting on. So let's say you're working on a particular war game that you want to publish commercially, uh, and you're having a problem with some of the game mechanics. Well, you can have some of the best minds in, in the industry who are at the Connections Conference, if you're lucky enough to have them come to your particular place for the, for the uh, game lab, you have a few minutes where they have a panel discussion about that or whatever topic you put in. And it's, it's uh, again, we, we call it speed dating for war gamers, but it's really free consultancy. And then the final thing, as I mentioned, uh, from the, the 2002 uh, Connections Conference, we're still doing the working groups and workshops. Now, some of the, some of the working group co-chairs, some of the working group topics are such that they get together and start working um, right from um, the, when the previous conference ends. Um, Others just get together during the conference itself to have kind of a, a little workshop during the conference with, with different speakers and a little bit of a report. And, and that's fine. It, it varies from how much work is needed and how much work the co-chairs are, are willing to commit. So um, other things that you get to do when you're live. Uh, and then as far as the support from Connections, 
Uh, and I think this applies to all the connections worldwide. You get the education of the participants. You really do get advancing the art and science. Uh, you know, the, the name connections comes from the James Burke uh, PBS series, BBC period series uh, connections, where he says a lot of science advances, a lot of, a lot of uh, mankind's mastery of the environment, of mastery of technology uh, advances when you take old technology used in one industry and have it move to another industry because of connections. So uh, a technology used to make more uh, intricate patterns in weaving gets used to to do the census and, and, and that better weaving in France, uh, quicker census taking in the United States than in tabulation. Uh, and then that jumps to something else and that jumps to something else. Um, well, bring people together from Air Force, Army, Navy, Marines, DOD, joint staff, civilian industry, uh, civilian academia, uh, everybody's doing something better than anybody else. And so it, it moves forward as these happens. New applications, uh, that is that kind of goes along with the advances that the Air Force sees the Army is doing this, and they can do that same type of thing. And then the website is intended to be a year-round reference. Uh, some of them are better than others, but we've got this whole host of not only Connections conferences, but a whole host of Connections websites out there now. And uh, uh, as far as the host goes, and as a live conference, we still need a physical host to have a place where, where we can conduct it. They get uh, the conference to address specific issues, uh, really by the, the entire wargaming community. And, uh, and then they get a bully pulpit to talk about their wargaming efforts uh, to the whole community. Uh, so good stuff. As far as support to connections go, as far as the participants go, uh, we're always looking for, for speakers, uh, game demos, testers, uh, game lab works best when there's lots and lots of different topics that people are, are looking for. And all that can go into the, uh, uh, to the request for papers or go into the, to the website. And then, um, if there's something that, that you're doing in your day job that you're doing as part of what you're getting paid for, and you've been working on it for a while and you have time to, to keep working on it, um, why not get free consulting from across the wargaming community? If you'd want to be one of the co-chairs of a working group, we tend to try to match up somebody who's done a working group before with somebody who's new to the conference. And, and so just learning how to do wargaming better can help too. And then we need physical hosts. Um, we've been hosted by now by a uh, uh, federally funded uh, research and development organization, FFRDCs. We've been hosted by uh, Air Force, Army, Marine Corps. Would love to be hosted by the Navy some year. Um, and it's basically facility uh, that all these installations have facilities. Uh, they assign an action officer to, to be our local eyes and ears because we need to know about where to have an icebreaker, you know, where. What, what motel is a decent motel at a decent price, but there's zero dollars involved. Uh, Connections not only doesn't charge any registration, we don't have a bank account. Uh, now, most years we offer our participants to give us a certain amount of money and we'll provide food at, at the normal intervals. Uh, but if you bring sack lunches, uh, you get to participate for free, and that usually happens if it's being hosted at the Marine Corps uh, Wargaming Division. Some of the local Marines will just bring their lunches. Um, the uh, uh, and and uh, that's fine. Uh, you know the the objective is to advance and sustain the art, science, and application of wargaming. It isn't to make money. Next. Oh, <laughs> uh, I. Please forgive me. I, I've I've been teaching for for two out of the last three weeks. Uh, I keep saying next. Um, 
Anyway, so I started off by talking about how wargaming can save lives, how they can help us avoid wars, and if we must go to war, to win those wars with a lower cost in lives, time, and treasure. But they only do that, or let me rephrase that, they do that for the side that wargames more effectively. And one of the things that the Connections Conference can do is increase the odds that we and our allies will wargame more effectively than our adversaries. But to reach that goal, we need people to participate. So again, I want to thank Chris for all he's done, uh, Merle, uh, uh, the Dragoons, the whole crew that put this together, because the more people that know about wargaming, are more proficient about wargaming, can apply wargame more places and more effectively, the more people will come back from future conflicts alive and with all their limbs. And if we do a really, really good job, maybe we'll avoid some future conflicts altogether. A noble pursuit. That's all I have. Um, I don't know if any questions have been monitored or anything from Chris. So there was a couple of questions. Um, I don't know if I'll put them up there, but I can read them from here. Let me double check real quick. Uh, questions I had. Ah. Do you see favorite, questions? yeah, favorite war game. Yes. Um, well, as as much as I like print war games, and in general, I. I I like print war games more than computer because you can change them and and you you know how they work so you're you're not only playing the game but you're learning more about how the, the mechanics of it. Uh, I have to confess, my favorite war game is is the Civilization series. Uh, probably played it more than anything else, and one of the reasons why it's a favorite is that I've played it with my son when he was very very young. And I think it, it really was a good thing for him growing up. And I like to tell the story about how he started playing it like around Christmas when he was in first grade. He, could, he couldn't read very many words yet. So it was Civilization II, and I would read parts to him. And um, it was now almost the end of the school year, and he was reading more of it by himself. Um, and, and I was getting ready to teach at ACSC the next day. And I realized he was standing next to me. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm sorry. You know, uh, what? what is it? Do you want me to read something? He says, no. says, because uh, I knew he was playing Civilization. And I said, well, do you want my advice on what to invent? Nah, no. Well, I love you very much, but I have to do all this reading before I teach tomorrow. Uh, what is it? He says, well, Dad, um, I just invented railroads. And, well, uh, things really change when you invent railroads, don't they? And I said, yeah, tell me about it. He says, well, you know, my, my cities seem to be growing faster, and I seem to be building stuff faster, but, but that's not what I want to talk to you about. Um, you told me that whenever I invent railroads, I need to link all my cities by, by rail. Um, well, I'm almost done with that. But you also told me I need to keep two military units wherever my civilization touches another and one military unit, one city back in case they need reinforcements. Well, now I can get reinforcements anywhere right away by railroad. Do I really need to keep all those units one city back? And I'm like, okay, you're a first grader and you – grasped on your own the impact of increased mobility on the size of a reserve you have to maintain. I think I'm going to be in trouble. Well, um, what other medium other than wargaming would get a first grader to care about the impact of, of railroads on civilization, much less 
figure out on their own some second order implications. So a favorite game and, and one of my favorite illustrations about why wargaming is so important and so powerful. Great question. Thank you. Okay, then we game. Oh, okay. Um, this is a very good question. And um, it, it's something that, that I'm, I, I'm, I'm worried about at times, but there's, um, there's a flippant answer and then a more detailed answer. The, the flippant answer is, is what Walt Disney used to say. Um, you know, we, he, they, he would talk about different things they were doing on the wonderful world of color. And some of his people would say, you know, you're giving away the, the jewels. Uh, and he would say, no, 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 we can innovate faster than they can copy. Um, and, and that's, that's kind of a cute answer, but it's really not the right one. It, it a much, I think a better answer is uh, one of the things they would talk to the fighter pilots about when they were going on bombing raids over North Vietnam was a concept called threat prioritization that um, you might get hit by a SAM. You could dodge most of them, but they triple fire. You might get hit. And if you're hit, you might get shot down or you might get damaged. Um, then you might get hit by a, by a surface tear round. And again, you might, they may not hit you. It may be superficial damage. You may be able to limp home. You may, you may die. Or you could hit the ground. And if you hit the ground, you died. So pilots like to fly really low to, to be out of the envelopes for the air to air and air to ground. But if they flew too low, they were going to hit the ground and the PK of collision with the ground is 100. So um, when you look at the danger of our adversaries listening to what we're talking about doing wargaming more effectively, that's a danger. But a bigger danger, in my mind, is the danger of our people not knowing about wargaming. Um, I don't know who our adversaries are going to be 20 years from now. You know, uh, today we talk about Russia and China and, and Iran and North Korea and international terrorism. Terrorism is probably a pretty good bet. But, you know, maybe we can find a way to not be opponents with China or at least not be enemies with China some point in the future. Or not, you know, the, I like to say historians cheat. They know how it's going to turn out. They make it obvious. Um, the Chinese are putting a lot of resources into wargaming. Uh, they have an institute with a good sized budget. They, they put up a statue to the foundry. At least he retired as a two star. He, most of what I read, he was a brigadier uh, and like 600 people. If, if uh, this, my, my last slide has a picture of uh, uh, our good uh, British Army Major, um, uh, Major Moret, uh, giving a talk to the Institute. Uh, he got a chance to actually be on the grounds. Um, they're advancing wargaming. If we didn't have connections conferences, there'd be less chance of us, uh, of them, you know, somehow listening in or, or, or downloading or doing something to find out what we're talking about, but we'd also be communicating to ourselves much less. And the danger of we not knowing about wargaming and the impact of we not applying wargaming, uh, I think is a, is a more severe risk than the risk of them listening to what we say. Excellent question. Is there another one? All right. Well, those were really good questions. And uh, again, uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Murrow. Uh, thank you, um, I'm Chair Dragoons. And um, 
keep uh, keep moving the ball forward. Thank you. All right, let me switch chairs with you. So, so that's it for the first section of Connections Online, uh, the first session. Thank you very much uh, for everybody who's attended. The next session is going to start in about 10 minutes. Um, the link to that session is available both on the Discord channel or if you go into the, the, uh, the uh, description on YouTube, you'll see that there's a link to the next session in there, and it should start in about 10 minutes. Um, I'd really like to thank Matt for coming and talking as the as the father of the Connections Conference. He's, in effect, the grandfather of the Connections Online Conference. And so it's good to have him coming here as part of the kickoff. So with that in mind, we'll go ahead and uh, call this session right now. And the next session will start in just about 10 minutes. Thank you very much, everybody. See you then.